With this being Pentecost Sunday, we are reading from the book of Acts, second chapter, verses 1 through 16 and then 37 through 42. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowds gathered and were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs in their own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken of through the apostle, excuse me, the prophet Joel. Peter would go on to preach a very long sermon, and we pick it up at verse 37, which reads, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other disciples, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Let us pray. God, our Father, as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday, we pray that the energy and the spirit of the guidance, the direction of the Holy Spirit would be upon us as we seek to minister in your name. We pray, Father, that there would be a winsomeness in our lives that would draw other people to the Savior. Help us learn to express ourselves in the way we live, in the way we talk, in such a way that we draw other people to the Savior that they might ask of us, what makes you different? Why do you make the choices you make? And in our conversation, may we have opportunity to plant seeds for the gospel in these people's lives that you and your moving through your spirit can redeem and use and help them grow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the days of the great California gold rush, some prospectors discovered a very rich gold mine. We've got it made, they said, as long as we don't tell anybody else about our our claim. We have to stake it first and then hope that nobody jumps it. So they made a vow of secrecy. But they had to go into town for provisions and tools. When they left the town, a great host of people followed them. Why? Their secret was written all over their faces. It was impossible for them to hide what they had found. A gifted speaker was once asked what was the most difficult speaking engagement that he ever had undertaken. 
He said that it was an address he gave to the National Conference of Undertakers entitled, How to Look Sad at a $25,000 Funeral. It was impossible for the disciples to mask the joy on that first Pentecost. They were so happy and so boisterous that some passerbys accused them of being intoxicated. Imagine people driving by our church some Sunday morning and seeing us leave and see us so excited that they think we're drunk. The image is mind-boggling. One of America's favorite, most thoughtful humorists was Irma Bombeck, the late Irma Bombeck. In one of her columns years ago, she told about a little boy who was sitting in front of her in church. He was just as quiet as could be and certainly wasn't bothering anyone. But every once in a while, he would turn around and smile happily at everyone behind him. He did this several times to the pleasure of everyone who could see him. Suddenly, his mother jerked him around and told him in a loud stage whisper to stop grinning, for he was in church. It doesn't look right to be grinning in church. When uh, Herbert Buke stung him rather badly, some tears came to his eyes, And his mother said, that's better. Now no one will think you're smiling. I doubt that anyone would mistake that mother's demeanor for drunkenness or too much joy. In fact, in many respects, it's rather sad because her Christianity evidently was not impacting her in a very positive way. Many of us long to see the modern church infused with the same joy, the same love, the same energizing power that was characterized on that day in the church on that first Pentecost. That's only natural. We need to understand, however, that the first Pentecost was a unique event in human history. The descent of the Spirit on the church on that sacred day was an act of God, not of man. It was not something that was conjured up by the disciples. Because it was an act of God, we need to see that the same, there are some important implications that we have to take note of. First of all, Pentecost serves to remind us that the church is the creation of God. We are unlike any other institution in that respect. Beginning with Christ's selection of the 12 disciples and continuing through his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, climaxing on the day of Pentecost, the church was born in the mind of God long before anyone was ever baptized. The first Lord's Supper was served. Note the scene at the church's birth. The disciples were gathered all together in one place. But this was no constitutional convention. No one turned to Simon Peter and said, Pete, you will call the meeting to order, and after Matthew has given the invocation, we'll set to the business of starting a new institution that we're going to call the church. Nothing like that happened. Scripture tells us simply that as they were gathered in one place, suddenly a sound came from heaven like a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is how the church is born. Not from below, but from above. That is a most encouraging truth to me. A pastor tells of his family stay in a dilapidated motel one summer while on vacation. They had made their reservations long in advance, sight unseen. And upon arriving, they were a little bit taken back. They checked in. The next morning, however, they were awakened rather early uh, by a steady thumping of a wrecking ball working very close to them. The thumps just kept on getting louder and louder, and suddenly they realized that a huge wrecking ball was hitting part of the complex attached to the building where they were housed. They went down into the hall and looked out the window. The hotel seemed to be torn down around them. When they inquired at the front desk, they were told that that section where they were staying was not going to be torn down until after they had checked out, maybe a week or two later but they were beginning to tear down other parts of the building. 
There are many churches and denominations that sometimes feel like they are being housed in that motel, and the wrecking ball is already at work. Every uh, one major denomination for a period of time back 20 years ago was losing the equivalent of an 800-member church every day from its membership rolls. They really had to work very hard to try and stop the migration of people out of their church. They had to ask some really tough questions about what they were preaching and what they were studying and what was happening in worship. That's sort of scary. Unless you believe that the churches of God, individual local churches may lose their way, even great denominations may fade into history. But the church of Jesus Christ will not fail. Why? Because it's not a human invention, but a divine intervention. If the church of our generation fails, God will raise up a new and bolder church to take its place. The church is the creation of God. We see this in some of the statistics that we often run across. We discover that in uh, the turn of the to the beginning of the 20th century in 1900, about 95% of the Christians were in Western European or the United States countries. At the turn of the 21st century, we discovered that about 85% of the Christians happened to be in what we would now call third world countries. God has taken a hold of a whole new group of people, made them enthusiastic for their faith, and they are sharing that faith with other people. Just at a time when Western Europeans especially, but even in the United States, we're seeing churches that are dying off and are empty. Great cathedrals with hardly anyone there to worship. One congregation may be dying off, but others are being built up because God is getting a hold of people's lives. In the second place, Pentecost reminds us that the church exists for one primary reason, to communicate to the world the love of God revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice the manifestation of tongues. First, we have tongues of fire distributed and resting on each of them. And then they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. But wait, this isn't speaking in tongues as many Pentecostals will talk about. There were no interpreters present. None were needed. Indeed, in spite of the fact that there were persons present from many different nations, each of them heard the disciples speaking in their own language. What an amazing miracle of communication. How many times problems between groups of people have been aggravated by a breakdown in communication? Years ago, a news magazine uh, cited a humorous historical footnote that revealed how easily communication can be garbled. Some of you can remember that moving speech that President John F. Kennedy gave at the Berlin Wall in 1963 which he ended by saying um, a German phrase meaning, I am a Berliner. But according to the German vernacular, it really translates as, I am a jelly donut, since a Berliner is a type of donut in their vernacular. Remember how Paul warned against speaking in tongues without an interpreter present. The purpose of the church is to communicate. We are God's word in the world today. Why? Because we are Christ's body and he is the eternal word. We're called to communicate the good news of God's love revealed in Christ. There's a story about an English gentleman named Elfie. Elfie could do nothing right. He bungled everything he ever touched. One day in a moment of deep despair and uh, depression, He tried to take his own life, but he failed at that, too. While he was in the hospital, a friend came to visit, and the friend said, Elfie, why did you do it? And Elfie responded, because there's no good news anywhere. Every time I listen to the news, it's all bad. 
Because if there was something someone uh, knew was good news, they would tell me, wouldn't they? He went on to say that day after day, all the he heard about on the news was the bad things that were occurring. And he said, in my life, I already have enough bad things. What I need is for someone to tell me good news. Heaven help us. The world is filled with Elfies, just waiting for someone to bring good news into their lives. And friends, we are those charged with that responsibility. Now, we communicate this love in many ways. Some of you who are sports fans have undoubtedly noticed every once in a while big scripture signs at significant sporting events. The Super Bowl, Monday night football, baseball tournaments, um, golf tournaments, the Olympics, the Indy 500. In bold letters, letters you read John 3.16, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Romans 5.18. They pop up on bedsheets and signs hanging from upper decks, behind home plate, over golfers' heads as they putt, even on posters alongside the runway at the Miss America pageant, of all places. Those signs were originally the work of a man by the name of Roland Stewart and his wife, Margaret, and a friend, William King. The Stewarts had a rather modest lifestyle. They were traveling in a Toyota van, traveling over 55,000 miles per year, speaking to any religious group that would invite them. They received love offerings in order to buy tickets from scalpers for select sporting events when they knew that they'd be on TV. Then with a handheld television, they got in line and tried to find the right camera angle. Roland said in a People magazine article, we're evangelists who want to get everyone to read the book, the Bible, and we reach millions. We may only put out a scripture text, a reference, but then people get it in their mind and they go to a Bible and they look it up, especially if they've seen that reference a number of times. You see, Roland Stewart knew a time when he was addicted to alcohol and drugs. They had him by the throat, choking the life out of him. His life had fallen apart. Everything was going wrong. And one Sunday morning, he had the TV on and a church worship service was occurring and something he saw and heard got a hold of his life. He became a Christian and at that point in time, he told God, if you will straighten out my life, I will dedicate myself to sharing your word to people in whatever way I could. Now, he says, he's spreading the gospel free of commercial cost through every TV camera he can find at a sporting event. Roland's method of communicating the good news is not the same as yours and mine. You can argue how effective it is, but you have to admire his determination. How are you spreading the good news? How am I spreading the good news? Some are doing it by bringing up things that have happened at church, hoping that someone will ask them more about their faith and seeing if there's an opportunity to invite them to a church function. Others do it by explaining in a loving way why they make the decisions that they do. They might be saying, I feel that it's the Christian thing to do. Sometimes it leads to conversations that plant seeds of the gospel in people's hearts and minds. It may not be an immediate response, but often they discover that in a time of stress and uncertainty, that person will come back and ask them more. However it's done, each of us needs to find a natural way to talk about our faith and then let God take it from there. The church is God's creation. Our purpose is to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ's love revealed in Jesus Christ with as many people as we can. The ultimate goal, however, is the creation of a new community. I cite two pieces of evidence. First of all, as we have noted People from every different nation were present on the occasion of that first Pentecost. 
They heard the gospel in their own tongue. The good news is not restricted to a particular nation or a particular race or a particular class. The gospel cuts across every dividing line in society. That's why, as I said earlier, so many people in third world countries have responded to the gospel. And really, the strength of the church is in those countries, not in the United States or Western Europe anymore. And secondly, notice at the end of this second chapter the description of the early church following this Pentecost experience. And all who believed were together in all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now that initial wave of enthusiasm of sharing changed over a period of time. Some people took advantage of that sharing and so the church adjusted itself a little bit. But the same giving spirit continued on and began to touch the lives of many people. It has happened time after time after time. The Christian faith is a communal faith. Jesus said, whenever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am also. The purpose of Pentecost event was not simply the saving of individual souls, but the creation of a new community. That community was and is the church. The strength of the church is love. During the Italian occupation of Ethiopia in the days of Mussolini, Christian believers suffered considerable persecution. Many of them were jailed. In his book, Fire on the Mountains, Raymond Davis tells of the love demonstrated by believers for each other during this period of affliction, which in turn made a major impression on non-believers. For example, no provision was made to feed prisoners in jail by the invading army. This was the responsibility of relatives and friends. Christians in the prisons had no problem, though, they were well cared for by their friends and family. In fact, so much food was brought to them by fellow believers and church groups that enough remained to feed the unbelieving prisoners also. This observable love, vibrant though nonverbal, brought many to seek the Lord. Such love was previously unheard of. As a result, the word spread far and wide. Nonbelievers sought out believers to learn more about the Christian faith. When prisoners who had come to know Christ while in jail were released, they went back home and attended the nearest church. It's only right then that we should pray that we might be a church like at Pentecost if we understand what that means. The church at Pentecost was the creation of God, not of man. The church at Pentecost was a church that communicated the good news of Jesus Christ to all persons. The church at Pentecost was a community of faith, hope, and love. In these days in which we have seen our society upended somewhat by the COVID problems, we are reminded that very often God uses those negative experiences in life to allow the church to shine in a way that they can show love to people who in turn are drawn to the Savior because they are told that the love has first come from Christ. I don't particularly want people driving by our church some morning to think that we're intoxicated, but I'd like for them to see joy on our faces. I would like them to see how much we love one another. I'd like them to know that there is good news in the world the good news of God's great gift in Jesus Christ. How are you and I sharing that kind of joy with our relatives, friends, and neighbors? Do they see that Christ makes a difference in our lives? And because of that difference, are they drawn to ask us about the way we live our lives? What makes us different? 
Where do you get your joy? Where do you get your purpose? Where do you get your assurance in life, even when the world seems to be going against you? It's often in those opportunities of sharing why we follow Christ and what difference he's made in our lives that we have the opportunity of leading people to the Savior. We don't have to be evangelists, but very often we lead people to a place where someone who is good at sharing a further word of Christ is able to bring them to the completion point of becoming Christians. Are we winsome in our faith? Do people notice who we are and the difference that Christ makes? That is the challenge of Pentecost Sunday. Let us pray. God our Father, we pray that we might be making a difference in people's lives because they see something different in us, something that is winsome, something that brings joy, something that shows them that we have a purpose and direction. We pray that the words that we speak and the way we live our lives might show people that Christ makes a difference to us. So lead us by your Spirit. Fill us with that Spirit so that we might have the effect of Pentecost. Maybe not in big groups, but in individual lives. After a few have been won, they may indeed be sharing the good news with others who themselves come to know the Savior. And so the chain reaction begins. We pray that you would work through us in that way. Amen.